Hey, you get your worship guides out. We're going to get into our series entitled Money Tree. Believe it or not, uh, we're going to talk about kind of, we kind of merge in money and Christmas at the same time. And before you freak out, if you're a new person here and you're a guest and you're thinking, you know what, that's exactly what I thought. Every time I go to church, it's very seldom, but when I do, it seems like they're always talking about money. And I just want you to know that wouldn't be true here. Uh, We don't even pass a plate in our church, but we do believe in giving. We wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without giving. And uh, but at the same time, uh, the heart of this series was that during Christmas, during this particular season, there was kind of two or three things that I wanted you to think about. And I'm just trying to be a good pastor. And this is what I think. I think one of the best things I can do in, in leveraging the word of God to you and to myself is help us realize how blessed we are already. And so part of this series is to just help you see, in particular, today's message will be about that, is to understand we are so blessed as a a nation, we're so blessed as a people, we're so blessed in New England, and I'm going to convince you to the best of my ability how blessed you are, whether you knew that or not. Second thing is, I want you to, you know, uh, the second purpose of this, the heart of this series is to, to help you avoid some things, some pitfalls and some traps when it comes to spending. A lot of times people... Uh, make a lot of regretful decisions during this particular holiday. Some of you are thinking, I just did yesterday, oh my gosh, and Black Friday, I already went by, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, we, you know, there's forgiveness and there's prayer at the end of the service for that. Uh, But I I just really just think it's good, like right in the, hey, 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 whoa, 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 check it out. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Let's let's not do things that, you know, kind of put a financial noose around our neck. And then January, we're all looking for help and counseling. And then third thing is, I want to give you certain certain, um, kind of avenues where you can make a difference uh, with your resources, human and financial. What determines where our money goes is our self-control, but also our priorities. And so the things that we do with our resources and how we steward them require self-control, but also the things we do with our money is a result of our priorities. And I want to help you see and have certain priorities when it comes to your resources. Amen? When I was young, um, my, my dad, who's, who's good with money, um, he, he was always trying to train me in different ways. And, 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 and I can remember, you know, he would, he, you know, he'd say things like, he'd have these little, like, uh, you know, EWF, you know, principles, these little dadisms. And he'd say things like, son, you can have a ice cream now or you can have a bike later. And I'd be like, ice cream now. You know what I mean? Like, I was always... Immediate gratification, you know what I mean? And, and I could just, I could see the, I could see the ice cream, I could see the helados, you know what I mean? I could see the multi-scoop thing, chocolate, you know, it was like awesome. And I couldn't wait, you know, and um, I couldn't see the bike, you know, and, and then later he, you know, he'd say things like, you can, you can, uh, you can play now and pay later, or you can pay now and play later. And I'd be like, I'll play now, I'll play now. And it took a while for him to kind of, kind of put some right things in me and And I kind of had, and I think all of us in some phases in our life, maybe not as graphic as that, have struggled with, you know, immediate gratification, and I want it now, and I want more, and and all of those kind of things. And so my dad used to say things also, maybe your dad or your parent or your coach or teacher said, you know, son, money doesn't grow on trees. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? Like, money doesn't grow on trees, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, as a young person, I was like, maybe there is a tree out there that has (laughs) money on it. That would be awesome, you know? Is it, was that in the Garden of Eden? You know, I just, but, but, but one of the principles that I want to give you kind of as we, we go forward in this series is that money's not designed in God's word to grow on us. It's, it's designed in God's word to go through us. We're simply blessed to be a blessing, it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, where we're conduits of cash. We're not supposed to be collectors of cash. And, and God wants to use what we have uh, for a greater purpose. But when I get into today's message, and that's what we'll do over the series, is we'll talk about that principle in many different ways. But today's message, I was sitting uh, kind of in my power chair in my house, and I, was, I had this kind of picture of Christmas come to me. And I remember going back... Oh, many, many years ago, many, many moons ago, and I was a really young kid, and, and, and just kind of, just a little excerpt of the family life and the fries at Christmas time. We, we, would, we would have this tradition of opening our presents, and you had to wait until everybody was up in the morning, and everybody was in the room at the same time, and there were certain things that had to be set up first, and man, it was torture for me as a young person. I, I slept in every other day of the year, but on Christmas Day, I was up bright and early, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, come on, let's go, you know, and 
blowing a trumpet and let's get out. And, and, and anyway, finally, you know, I was first to arrive. Finally, the family would show up. But my dad had uh, taken all the gifts that were under the tree and he put it in the designated spots where we were going to be sitting. And, of course, my mother labeled everything perfect and I could do a whole message on the neurosis of labeling. And, but... <laughs> I had my stack, you know, with my names on it, and my mom had hers, and my dad had hers, and my sister had hers, and I remember all the stacks were in the room, and I remember this one particular year looking around and thinking, wait a minute, my stack's not as big as her stack, <laughs> and mom's stack, even dad's stack, and when I got to the end of this little span of the room, I thought to myself, that's it? <laughs> and before I had even opened a present, I was discontent. I was upset. I was, now, it could have been the smaller gifts were better than the bigger gifts, but back then, big ruled. You know what I mean? Like, big boxes ruled. You know what I mean? I mean, I wanted the biggest box. They could have put, like, you know, a Twinkie inside of it, but as long as that box was six feet tall, I was happy. But anyway, I was upset in this particular day, and I was discontent, and thank God I've grown up a little bit since then and got a little different perspective. And when I look back now on either end of life, I look back now and see, you know, a, a young child who's born into the world. They can't even crawl. They can't even, they can barely walk. And, they, and we buy them gifts, which I think is kind of comical. You guys spending all that money for these little rug rats. And, and we buy them gifts and they go to open them. And what are they happy with? The wrapping paper, the box. They don't care about the gift. They're so happy. I don't know if you watched Insta Family, but I mean, there's this movie that's out, and it was just all about the boxes. And then, and then you go to the other end of the spectrum. Now I'm older, and I have kids who have kids, and I am, I do not, I'm not preoccupied with what I receive. I'm preoccupied with enjoying what they're getting ready to receive and what, what, what I've given to my children and my children's children. And hidden in, inside this illustration are some powerful, I think, secrets to contentment. And before we get into like certain behaviors and habits and principles from God's word about money, the opener of the series is just kind of deal with some heart stuff. Deal with like really our attitude and, and, our, and kind of this, this idea of contentment. And, and you might think, well, that's not me. I'm not like that. Okay, well, have you ever been one of those get rich quick kind of people? Like, how many times, don't answer out loud, but how many lottery tickets have you bought? You know, how many times have you gone so-and-so to, you know, and, and, and to, you know, to play the slots? It's, oh, it was just for fun. It was just for fun. Was, is it fun just handing your money to somebody knowing that the house always wins? You know? And, and how many times do we try to do something through a deal or through a business deal or something like that? And we're not doing it through honest gain. We're doing it, you know, we're not doing it through steady plotting. We're doing it quick, 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 quick. It's underneath that that I'm submitting to you could be that we're discontent. We're not realizing some things. We're not understanding some things. Warren Buffett, who's the richest man in the world, he says his, his number one rule of investment is never lose the money you've already earned. He, he doesn't say never use it. He says never lose it. In other words, you, you, money's a tool, and it's, you, you, you got to do certain things to survive and to live, but a lot of the money, we just give it away. We're foolish and frivolous with the money that we have, and we're taking great risks in order to try to get great returns, and, and really, that's not how God wants us uh, to, to succeed or to progress or to prosper. And so, uh, it, you know, if it's too good to be true, it's probably, it's probably not true, Right? And so a lot of us sometimes get lured by certain schemes and happen. It's because a lot of times we're not happy with what we already have. And, and when we get it, we're not happy for very long. You know, you get a new car. My, my, I just bought my wife a new car a little while ago. And, man, those first two weeks, it smelled good in there. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's, it's just like life. But then, boom, it's gone, right? Or I don't know about you, you get a new shirt, you know, and I buy a new shirt, and it's like the first time I wear it, I'm like, I'm too sexy for my shirt right now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then four weeks later, I'm like, do I look fat? You know what I mean? It's, mm, I don't think I'll wear this anymore, you know? I don't like this sweater, you know? And, and uh, that's the truth. Sometimes that happens, you know? And uh, you buy shoes, and, and I go online, I'm like, oh, I got to have, I got to have, I got to have, I got to click, click, click. Shoes, I mean, that is my Achilles heel in my house. It is, it is a problem. And then I end up not wearing the shoes two weeks later that I just bought. And so why is that? Why don't those things satisfy for very long? It's because, it's because people change, things don't. 
That's what happens. Is a lot of times is we're the ones that are changing. We, we are addicted to change. We are addicted to upgrades. We are addicted to the next best thing that's coming down the pike. And, 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 and every person, yes, has the right to life, liberty, but not the purchase of happiness, but the pursuit of it. Right, everybody? And so, I don't know. Think about your Christmas last year. How many of you are still just, you know, pumped about last year's Christmas gifts? You know, and I was just thinking yesterday, man, last year's Christmas was awesome, you know. No, you can't even remember one, two, three, four, five things that you got last year. Why? It's temporary. Poof, gone. Just like that, right? And so we do things to get this little fix. Now, there's a guy in our church who his life has been transformed uh, by and through relationship with Jesus Christ, but also you as a community and our leadership here. And I'm going to ask Joe Iacona to come up and share a testimony live to us a little bit about this. Come on, would you welcome him as he comes up? All right, Joe, it's you, man. Do your thing. Good morning, church. It's such an honor, and I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, prior to attending Connect Church, I lived in a $3.2 million home. It had five bedrooms, five full baths. It had the big carport five acres of farmland, and it, it uh, had the BMW in the garage that was never driven in the wintertime, the convertible, just, just a total, uh, almost like a spiritual jail cell. So I had expensive watches, $15,000 vacations in the Cayman Islands at the Ritz-Carlton. I was all over the Caribbean, stayed in the nicest five-star suites, but yet I had no peace. I had no, no freedom. It's good. At times, you know, I was very angry, haughty, pumped up with pride. Uh, you know, I wasn't grateful to God for all the blessings and everything that I had. So, you know, uh, what happens is you think you're controlling everything. You know, you're all self-esteem and not Jesus' esteem. Come on. So, you know, I'm like, I'm Joe. I'm awesome. Without God in my life, guiding me spiritually and financially, I focused on what I didn't have instead of everything that I had. So I need more vacations. I need more money. I need more material things. You know, nothing that I tried to go after ever gave me happiness. It was always fleeting. It was never fulfilling. Never completed me. So, you know, with more money comes all these problems and all these uh, sinful desires and, and uh, chasing material things and chasing money. Uh, it was never going to make you happy. It, it, what happens is you need to chase God's calling. You know, you, yeah. you, you need to uh, follow God's higher laws. You, you, you need financially and spiritually, if you follow the Lord, you know, everything else, it loses its appeal in the world before you even lose it. So, you know, by not practicing, trusting God, biblically, uh, financially, the way that God would like us to. I didn't leverage what was already the Lord's. Mm. So deservingly, it, it was gone. Now I live in a box in a one-room apartment with my cat, Howie. I've never been happier. I mean, <laughs> I'm grateful, humble to God for all I have, for his undeserved love, his grace, his kindness. He gave up his only begotten son Come for on, us. preach, boy. So, you know, it's one of these things where God got me to connect to this church that for edification, for correction, for direction. Come on. So, you know, he gave me a new personality. He gave me a, a good attitude, you know? I'm humbled for everything that I have, every second, every day that the Lord gives me. For our spiritual leaders, our family, our spiritual family, the worship music, this church, the elders, the pastors, I get to serve the Lord, not I have to serve the Lord. Mm. Yeah. You know? So, businesses and churches, they succeed or fail because of leadership. I was check to check when I came here. I was down, inside out, outside up. I mean, when I came to Connect, I started a new job prior. My father had died that month. I was broke. I, 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 despite all that, I, I paid for his funeral, yet I started tithing on my gross pay because I believe in PD and the leadership here. You know, and I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. So here we are, less than a year later, spiritually and financially, it's nothing short of a miracle for me. Healthy things grow. My bank account's growing. My company bonuses keep growing. My blessings are a thousandfold. The happiest days are not the big house, the big vacations, the bling, the watches, the clothes. That's right. It was serving at Relate, serving on fire for the Lord and 300 pastors. That was the most fulfilling day of my life. I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I could feel God. To serve with my cousin Dominic and serve the Lord shepherds was fulfilling Come on. more than any money. Amen. So, I put my time, my faith, my money into imperfect man, into the stock market, into worldly desires. They, you know, they took everything from me. In return, they gave me nothing. God was asking for so little. In return, he's given me eternal life. He's given me everything. So, if I, you know what? Putting all my faith in the world didn't work out for me. 
if 10% could do this for me in a short time, can you imagine what God will do for you? So I just wanted to thank you, everybody, for allowing me to share what was on my heart today. Let's give a big round of applause for the great leadership that we have here for, <laughs> He's so with PD awesome. and Pastor Stacy and everybody here. I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Joe. Bless Love everybody. you, man. You can give that mic to them. Thanks, buddy. Love you. Come on. Give it up for Joe. All right, come on up. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. Joe, you cannot have my job. <laughs> Hey, here's what the Bible says. If you love money, you'll never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you'll never get all you want. It's useless. You know who said that? Solomon. And by the way, he said that as the richest man on the planet Earth. He'll have more money than any of us will ever have, and that's what he said. He's basically saying it's useless. He's the great theologian Mick Jagger. You can't get no satisfaction. That's what basically he's saying there. The wealthiest man in the world says you're not going to be happy from that. So if there's anybody out there that like to be less fatigued, uh, less stressed, uh, less, less expenses, you know, uh, less anxiety, uh, less conflict, less dissatisfaction, does anybody like any of that? All right. Then we have to learn a secret. We have to learn a secret, and call, it's called the secret of contentment. Look what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 12. The Bible says, I know, Paul speaking, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've been on both ends of that, just kind of like Joe. I've learned the secret of being content in, in every situation, whether well-fed, hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. It, it just goes to show you it's not what you have or what you don't have that actually brings contentment. But it's a secret, and Paul says, I've learned it. And so there's a secret there, but how many know you've got to learn what that secret is? And sometimes it eludes many of us because our nature kind of struggles with this. We have this tendency, you know, to, to, to this gravitational pull towards other things other than being content. So I want to give you kind of four keys uh, to contentment. And here's the first one if you're taking notes. And we kind of had this in our previous series a little bit too, but a different take on it. You need to stop comparing yourself to others. Now, there's nothing profound going to come out of my mouth in the next five seconds, but basically you need to stop it, stop it, stop it. It's just some things are just a decision. There are things that you can do because of your will. It's a muscle. I know some people that uh, made major lifestyle changes. They were smoking cigarettes, and they decided, I'm going to stop, that's it, and they stopped smoking cigarettes. There are people that have made decisions to change their physical, mental, whatever it is, just because they just said, that's it, that's enough, I'm not going to let that happen anymore, I'm just going to stop it. But here's a, here's a motivation for stopping comparing yourself, because you can't compare yourself to anybody else because you're not like anybody else. You are unique. Do you realize that? Some people have a phrase, you know, or use a phrase, one in a million. No, you're one in billions. You know, every snowflake that falls from the sky is unique. You are more unique than the snowflakes that fall from the sky. And so for you to compare yourself to someone else is like a mockery. It's, 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 it's like a mockery to God's creation, to his creative properties. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says in verse 12, it says, We do not dare, ha, that's strong language. We do not dare classify or compare ourselves. In other words, God's saying uh, through the Apostle Paul, how dare you? That's a rejection of what God did, his perfect design, his creation of you. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his masterpiece, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Even before you came to be, he created you to do something, and he created you a masterpiece, a unique work. Amen? And so sometimes... We forget, and so we start comparing ourselves. I think comparison is America's favorite indoor sport. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are going to go on a lot of Christmas parties, you know? And you're going to go into people's houses, and you're going to have to resist this tendency to start comparing. Oh, look at those kitchen cabinets. <laughs> oh, wow. Thinking about my cabinets right now, and they don't look like that. Look at those, you know, for Micah, this, and look at that refrigerator, you know, it doesn't have any finger marks on it. That's incredible. Man, that pull-out drawer, and oh, look at all these steaks that are inside there. I wish I had that much meat in my house. You know what I mean? Look, oh my gosh, that television, how many inches is that thing? I don't have a television that big. You know, and, 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 and what happens is we go down that lane and we get frustrated. We get frustrated. We get discontent. I know a couple from a friend's church who was, 
struggling with financial issues. And so uh, she and he got into kind of a stewardship financial group to help get free in their finances. Sometimes you have to learn from other people. You got to get in groups for that. And so they go to this group. Well, this, they didn't know that this family that they were going to do group with had come out of tremendous consumer debt and problems and then became just incredible, transformed in their finances. And God began to bless them. They were incredible givers, but they had a really nice house. And so as they're leaving, this woman's still struggling with discontent, and she says to her husband, she goes, did you see? He goes, what? The, what? the husband said, what? She says, did you see their furniture? He said, no, no, what? He goes, their furniture dates all the way back to Louis the Fourteenth." <laughs> and the husband's like, well, our furniture dates all the way back to Ikea on the 15th. <laughs> so don't even think about it. Stop going there, okay? And so <laughs> we do that. We do that all the time, and Americans sometimes don't seem to understand, you know. You, you don't need to, uh, I must learn to, in other words, admire something, but I don't have to acquire something, right? It's okay. You must learn to rejoice in other people's happiness, but you don't necessarily have to have it. In fact, here's a follow-up quickly. I don't have to own it in order to enjoy it. Sometimes, like, we have hobbies, right? We have things that we want to do. Some people want to go skiing in the mountains. Some people want to go skiing in the summertime, you know, jet skiing. And so we, we go out and buy that for the thing that we're only going to do two or three times a year. Like, just rent it or borrow somebody else's. You know what I mean? I mean, I, have, I can't believe how many people sometimes they, they, uh, they aspire to acquire something only to go out and spend all their time working to pay for what they bought and not enjoying what they bought. How often does that happen? Oh, I'm going oh, to buy a, you know, a, 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 a cape house, and, and I got nothing against people buying cape houses, so just, you know, what? in fact, if you have one, I am happy to help you <laughs> use that. And, and, and take advantage of that so that if you're not getting the full blessing of it because you can't be there, I'll be there for you. I got your back. I got your back, okay? So I don't want to be misunderstood, right? But, 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 but then we buy that, and then the 90% of the year has spent all our time paying for that. And we got to insure it, and we got to paint it, and we got to repair it, and we got to, you know, go down and make sure somebody's taking care of it. And again, I will take care of that. If you need help, I'll take care of you that. So I, I don't have to own it. I, I think I'll just use your stuff. <laughs> Come on, I'm, 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 I'm pumping out some, some wisdom here right now, okay? I'll just borrow it. I don't have to own it, right? So, so in fact, when you see people with all that uh, and you think that's the answer, ju you just need to pray. You just need to pray. You need to get spiritual. You need to drop down on your knees and you need to just be like, ah, this is a prayer you should pray. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> I don't have those payments. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You pray that. Pray that. Pray that. Things will change, right? Okay, so comparison's bad, all right? And it's not just, it's just not a bad idea so you won't be happy. Listen, comparison is a sin. Comparison is a sin in the Word of God. It's a serious sin. It actually makes the top ten in the Scriptures. Top ten, that means the Ten Commandments. You know, you, you shouldn't bear false witness, and you shouldn't commit adultery, and you shouldn't murder. And number 10, you shouldn't covet. It's the same word there. In fact, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 17, look at what it says. It says, you shall not what? Covet. Say it out loud. You shall not covet. You should not covet anything that belongs to someone else. See, covet is simply the uncontrolled desire to acquire. It's uncontrolled. It's okay to desire. It's just when it's uncontrolled. In fact, the Hebrew word for coveting is pant. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love his truck. I've got to have his truck. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I've got to have that watch. <laughs> got to have those stilettos. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've got to have that dress. <laughs> that's, that's Hebrew, okay? Hebrew always has <laughs> behind it. <laughs> and chutzpah. Okay, and then, and then in the Greek, the word is the word is hold tightly or, or grasp, so you can't let it go. That's what covet is. And see, so if you if you think if you have something you can't give away, you don't own it. It owns you. You don't possess it. It's possessed you. I'm talking about anything. Everything. The, a, a law of stewardship and a law of contentment really is my house is not mine. It's God's. 
If he tells me to do something with that, I, I need to be free. If I, if I can't, then it owns me. It owns me. And that's affecting your contentment. In fact, you know, God is not, let, let me say it like this. Another part of this is God's not saying you can't desire things, though. So don't misinterpret me here. That's not Christianity, no desire. That's Buddhism. Whoa, I didn't expect that coming. Buddhism, <laughs> like what? Buddhism is basically the attempt to remove desire because they believe desire is why you have pain and suffering. And so the goal of a Buddhist is to remove all desire, and ultimately at the end of that, you will achieve what's called nirvana. Nirvana, some people think nirvana is ultimate pleasure. You know what nirvana means? By definition, it means nothingness. The goal is I don't feel anything, I'm not drawn to anything, I don't have any desire for anything. No, 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 no. That's not Christianity, that's Buddhism. God w gave you desires. He simply wants to steer them. He simply wants to sanctify them so they actually bring you true satisfaction and significance and happiness, not temporary or temporal. In fact, the Bible says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37, 4. God can do nothing without great desire. All the greatest things that are done on the planet Earth were done with a great desire. The greatest buildings that were ever built, the greatest businesses that were ever built with great desire, the great, the orphanage that were built, the hope centers that will be built in the Dominican Republic, they're done with a great desire. Desire's not the problem, it's when it's uncontrolled that it becomes a problem. Can I have an amen out there? Okay, so coveting, we got to be careful and comparison always leads us to coveting. Number two, life was meant to be enjoyed, not just endured. Now, we see, one of the reasons sometimes we're not enjoying life is because we're not enjoying what we already have. We're not enjoying what we already have. So many times we're so busy going after what somebody else has that we're not enjoying what we already have. How many people do you know in your life right now, or maybe you're one of them, that's overextended themselves to buy something, build something, do something, and yet we're not enjoying that something? We're too busy paying for it. Great backyards and great pools and great toys. And again, I'm not against any of that. Again, you can have those things as long as they don't have you. So God wants you to enjoy life. I don't know if you realize that. He's not some cosmic killjoy who's out there like, you need to be really serious if you want to serve me. <laughs> you know? You need to have a frown on your face. You can't be happy. You can't smile. You can't laugh. No, no, no. God, is, he sits in the heaven and, and laughs, the Bible says, in the book of Psalms. And, and God, is a, he created life, he created things within you so you could enjoy life. He gave you taste buds so you could, he gave you taste buds so, and then he gave you Cinnabon. <laughs> and he gave you raspberry Entenmann's Danish. Sorry, I'm having a moment. I feel, I feel dizzy. Uh, <laughs> He gave you ears, and then he gave you music. Yes. See, this is just a little sidebar for all the evolutionists out there. They're still subscribed to that. There's no, there's no explanation for why music was created. It has no correlation or connection to survival. Music was simply given for our pleasure. It doesn't do anything. What does mu music do? It expresses every emotion known to man. Every emotion that could possibly be expressed or experienced comes through music. Why? God gave you that for pleasure. It gave you that because God is a God with emotion. And you were created in his image, and he wants you to enjoy the same things he enjoys. So he gave you music. Is that powerful? He gave you skin so you could have pleasure when you touch things, when you experience things, and even touch someone else. He gave you eyes that are full color so that you could have a sunset and a sunrise. And instead of making it black and white, he made it full color for you. Everything God created was for your enjoyment. Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19, uh, it says this, and I'll try to find the scripture somewhere in my notes. Um, here it is. It says, if God gives wealth and property... Let us enjoy them. No problem. I gave you some stuff. You need to enjoy it. Definitely. We should be grateful, though, and enjoy what we, I would like to say, already have. Worked for. It is a gift from God. So everything you already have, are you enjoying it? You know, Rick Warren is, is, is a guy who wrote the most popular book in human history next to the Bible. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. It's been in, like almost every nation in the world, and it's been translated in so many languages, it's too hard to even remember how many, and he could be like a billionaire from that, but he donated all the proceeds to church and ministry, 
But he was a saver, and so for 30 years he just put away money to the point where he was able to, for the last 10 years, not take a salary from his church, and he's a what you call reverse tither. He gives 90%, and he lives on 10 and just because of the principles of God's word, he's a phenomenal leader when it comes to the subject of money. But he, he talks about this just principle, you know, of contentment and really just learning to be able to enjoy life. And one of the favorite things he, he does is he, here's this multimillionaire who, by the way, knows 20 plus billionaires by name. And they all come to him for advice and counsel. And he's got this old beat up chair and he takes it out and he's put out his, his yard. And it's up on a hill. You got to climb a fence. The chair, chair's like 20 years old. And his favorite thing to do is go out and watch the, suns, the sunrise come up in the morning. And, and he says, you know, he says, that experience wouldn't be any better, even though I could afford to do it, if I bought an encrusted, you know, uh, diamond-encrusted Barca lounger. If I bought a diamond-encrusted chair, high-end chair, would that experience be better or worse for me? It wouldn't be better, because the experience is coming this way. In fact, if it was such a nice chair, somebody would want to steal it. He says, nobody, everybody's walking by this chair. They don't care about that chair. He says, I'm enjoying life, but I don't have to have that in order to have the kind of enjoyment that God wants us to have. See, you need to enjoy what you already have. Some of you have forgotten that. What I love about uh, Angel and Judith being here today is they remind me when I go on missions, the things and the lessons that I learn. You know, one of the things that I appreciate when I come back from missions is I appreciate a hot shower. Holy God, it's a spiritual experience, <laughs> especially after you've not had hot water, you know? You know what I appreciate sometimes when I go to other parts of the world? I appreciate ice. Do you know, you, you, this country that you're in, like most parts of the world, you, don't get, you get a pop, you get a soda, a Coke, whatever you want to call it, you don't get ice with it. Has you, have you ever had a 7-Up or a root beer warm? It sucks. <laughs> it's terrible. I love ice. I love ice. You know what I love? I love the internet. Uh, if you put me up in a hotel, you can put me up in the no-tell, motel. I, don't, I won't tell. I, I, I just want internet because I want to connect. And it could be the worst room in the world, but is there ability to connect? Man, I was in, a, I was in, the, in an airplane a lot recently, and I'm 30,000 feet in a chair floating in the air, and I've got internet. I'm like, this is the life. You know? I think sometimes we forget one of the things I wrote in my notes that I, that I really appreciate. And again, when you go on missions, you appreciate this. I appreciate toilet paper. Because <laughs> you don't know what you have till it's gone. <laughs> you don't know what you have till it's gone. <sighs> memories, memories. Anyway, um, some of us, we have a when and then mentality. We're like, when I get this, then I'll be happy. When I, when, when I have a boyfriend, then I'll be happy. When I have a girlfriend, then I'll be happy. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I have kids, then I'll be happy. <laughs> Hang on, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. <laughs> then it morphs to, when I get remarried, then I'll be happy. <laughs> and when my kids move out, then I'll be happy. And when this message is over, then I'll be happy. Okay, just kidding. All right. See, here, write this down if you're taking notes. You are as happy as you choose to be. You're as happy as you choose to be. It's a choice. Happiness is a choice. Philippians 2, 5, it's not in your notes, but have this attitude that was in Christ Jesus. That means you can have it. You can have it. What makes me happy costs nothing. I didn't have to buy it, acquire it, admire something from somebody else for it. One of the greatest things that makes me happy is being with my grandson, Zion. I love, I love my grandsons equally, but my, my grandson, Zion, he's, right now, he's, he's just, he's a spaz, okay? He's, he's, he's just so happy he oozes. If you go on my Facebook right now, you'll see him, he just laughs, and he just cackles, and he screams, and, and, and I'll drive through traffic, and, and I'll, I'll make time. Why? Because I, it's just, I can just hang out with him, and he just makes me laugh, and then, and, and, it, and when I walk away, I'm so happy, and it costs me nothing for that. The best things in life are Free, free, right? They're free. And so just remember, you know, a lot of times we forget that. And sometimes people say, well, I need to have more PD. I don't have enough. Well, you got two choices if you don't have enough. You can do two things. You can work more or you can want less. <laughs> Think about which one is easier. <laughs> I don't have enough. I want more. Well, then work more. <laughs> Stay up later and get another job and hustle and bustle and toil and sweat or want less. Or want less. 
Okay? Because the law of contentment, 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says this. Uh, it says, um, backing up, it says, command those. This is my job from this scripture to you. It says, command those who are rich. By the way, that's us. See, you're rich relative to the rest of the world, and you have to do that to be honest. You have to contrast it with the rest of the world. See, if you have change in your pocket or in somewhere in your, your car or somewhere in a jar somewhere, you're in the top 10% of the world because you have change. If you have a refrigerator that keeps things cold, you're in the top 5% of the world's richest people in the world. If you have a car, you're in the top 2 or 3%. It's like 2.5% in the world if you have an automobile. You are rich. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm loaded. Okay. <laughs> Some single girls are like, really? Uh, can I get you a number? <laughs> awesome. Wow. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Now, there's a kind of a recipe in here for contentment, and I can't preach this message, but just note that. Four things in this particular text that keep you content. Don't be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God. So you gotta, you got to not be arrogant. you got to put your hope in God with everything for our enjoyment. So everything he did is there for us to enjoy. Then it says command them to do good. Here's the, here's the third thing. you got to do good. Okay, so you take what you have and do something good with it, not something selfish with it. To be rich in good deeds and to be generous. Last one, willing what? To share. So, so can you be wealthy and not materialistic? The answer is yes. Do those four things. You can. You can be wealthy and not materialistic. You just got to do those four things, okay? In fact, giving. Let me, let me just do something. Joe said something. I didn't tell him to say this. He wrote his whole testimony himself. Uh, everything he said came from him. I had nothing to do with it. But he said something about tithing. As soon as I say that, it gets quiet. <laughs> uh, but tithing, let me say, I've been tithing for 27 years. I, I never missed. Every single month for 27 years. Changed my life. This is what, this is what it does. It, it breaks the back of materialism. It just forces, it's hard for me to get too materialistic because tithing, in Deuteronomy, it says it actually breaks the grip of materialism in our life. It just reorders your finances to reflect that you are content and not discontent. Keeps things in line. All right, I'll move on because you don't want to hear about that right now. Okay, number three, the Bible says this. Life is not about the accumulation of things. Of things, okay? Luke chapter 12, awesome verse. It says this. And when he went on to say, Jesus speaking, he said, Watch out, guard yourself from every kind of greed because your true life is not made up of the things you own, no matter how rich you may be. See, sometimes as, as men in particular, but also the ladies, sometimes we confuse our net worth with our, with our self-worth. We confuse our valuables with our values. Never think your value is connected to your valuables. Nothing could be more deceptive. Realize that the greatest things are not in things. The greatest things in life are not in things. It's about giving to others. It's not about how long I can live and, 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 and through plastic surgery keep myself looking young. No, it's not through duration. It's through donation. It's not, it's, not about, it's not about living. It's about giving. It's about relationship and people and investing in things that really matter. One of the greatest prayers in the Bible is the prayer of Jabez, and it talks about enlarging your territory. Some of you know that. But there's a prayer of Agur in the Proverbs chapter 30 that has some great wisdom in it. Look at this. Proverbs 37, it says this. Uh, this, this proverb says, I beg two favors of you from me, lest... Let me have them before I die. Excuse me. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, look at this prayer. Give me neither poverty nor riches. <laughs> I don't think many of us pray that second part. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to be poor. God, I pray. Amen. You know what I mean? But this is saying, pray that you neither be rich nor poor. Poor nor rich. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich... I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? Here's what happens to people who get rich that become materialistic, that become discontent, that are not conduits of cash, that are not generous sharing and doing good to other people is you become prideful and you think you don't need God. Or on the other end, if you're going without or you're struggling or you're poor, you become too poor and it may steal from others and insult God's holy name. So we have poor character or poor testimony as a result of that. Again, either extreme can help us make us forget that God is the source of all things. Final point. Everybody say, this has been a great message, Pastor. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> All right. I, I have to make you say things so that I can feel happy. All right. <laughs> I focus on what will last forever. Last point, I'll focus on what will last forever. And, and this is about eternal values, eternal priorities, and, and, and nothing that we have is going to last forever. This building that we, you know, a nice building we have and climate control and a new stage we just got, all these things that have happened, it won't last. It's all corruptible. It'll all be gone. Your car, your clothes, even the, the nicest things you have, they'll all be gone one day. You can't take them with you. There's nobody going to take all those things with them, with them in a hearse. Nope. It's all going to be gone. And so to put our, our, our stock in all that and invest in that is kind of crazy. There's really only two things that last forever. The first one is the Word of God. Can I have an amen? amen. The Bible says the Word of God will last for, forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will remain, the Bible says. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the Word of God lasts forever. Isn't it interesting that we read other things that we don't believe everything we're reading... Listen to what I'm saying. We read newspapers, vlogs, blogs, you know, all kinds of things. We read those things that we don't believe, but we say we believe in the Word of God, and we have a hard time reading it. We could all say, I love how that hurts, Pastor. That was an ouch moment. But I hope that you realize how important the Word of God is to transform your life, and you're receiving the incorruptible Word of God. The question is, are you going to believe it? And believing it means that you just don't say, I agree. It means you put it into practice. That's what it means. The second thing that will never change is people. People. People last forever. People will last in one of two places. And this is hard to hear, but we're, either, we're, all, we're all eternal beings, but our destination is only determined on this side of life. We can make a choice. We have a choice on this side of life where we will spend our eternity, with him or without him. Otherwise, why did Jesus come? Why did he die on the cross? If it wasn't about splitting heaven uh, you know, and hell wide open and populating heaven, then Jesus came and it was a waste of time. Hell was not created for us. It was created for the devil and his angels. But we have to choose to let Jesus pay for our sins or we pay for him ourselves. It's about people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Bible says, For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be, what can be seen lasts only for a time, but what can be, not be seen lasts forever. Here's the secret of contentment. My final point, write this down. Finding my security comes in, in, in self and in satisfaction, not in what I have, but in whose, in whose I am, in whose I am. Would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you, and I'm going to ask Pastor Chris to come and join us in the Framingham campus, and I'd ask you to be very, very still. There's a tendency to move around during this point, and I'm asking you to be very, very still and reverent. Be very still. Could you close your eyes and bow your heads with me? The scripture says in the book of Psalms, but as for me, my contentment is not in wealth, but it's in seeing you and knowing all is well between us so that when I awake in heaven one day, I will be fully satisfied because I will see you face to face. Maybe you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and you put hope in something else other than in Jesus Christ. God wants one day, you to cross over from this life to the next, and when you see him face to face, all would be well. In order for all to be well, then, now is the day of salvation for you. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and you'd like to, it's, it's a simple thing to do, not necessarily live, but do and receive. You simply ask Jesus Christ into your life by grace through faith by a prayer of confession and I'd like to lead you into that prayer it can change your eternal destiny by receiving Jesus by grace through faith if you know he's talking to you you know he's speaking to you and he's knocking right on the door of your heart right now sir man boy girl I'm I'm begging you with all the influence that I have an opportunity that I've been given I'm asking you to say yes to God would you raise your hand and say pastor pray for me I don't want to leave before I've said that prayer before I've made that commitment come on put it up good and high so I can see you Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody? Thank you over there. Two of you over there. Thank you for your courage. Is there anybody else? Thank you. I see that hand. That's awesome. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. Thank you so much. God bless you. Church, would you pray this prayer with these wonderful, courageous people who, who raised their hand? Would you say that with them together? Say, Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my Savior, to be my Lord. I don't put my trust in things. I put my trust in you. 
And now, Father, I pray for every person who prayed that prayer, that you would seal that into the day of redemption, that they would know from the inside out that they are a child of God, not just a creation of God, because they chose you of their own free will. I thank you their eternity is secure because of their profession of faith and their confession in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen and amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap. God bless you guys. Love you all. Thank you. Come on up, Pastor Mark.